Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. We're coming to you this month from the Case and Kennedy Nursing Building on the MTSU campus. MTSU and nearby Columbia State Community College have inked an agreement to ease the transition of nursing students to a four-year degree. The formal announcement came during a signing ceremony on the MTSU campus in November. Uh, today we'll be signing an agreement uh, that will help in easing the transition of students who are pursuing a RN degree to a BSN degree RN at Columbia State uh, to MTSU. This is consistent uh, with one of the high priorities, not only of the Tennessee Board of Regents, but also uh, the state of Tennessee. We have two departments, two faculties who came together. They saw a need and they designed a program that will meet that need. And it's designed so that it's in the student's interest. It's not in the interest of either school, but in that of the student. It is indeed very appropriate, mm -hmm. with Columbia State being one of our major feeders and an institution, a very fine community college. We are very pleased to formalize this agreement with our colleagues from Columbia State. The partnership that we've had with Middle is a fantastic partnership and it has grown and it continues to grow and gets deeper. When we come together mm -hmm. uh, with this kind of partnership, it will help to meet the workforce needs for the state, state of Tennessee and the surrounding region. And so this today is just one more example of how a community college and a university join together to provide opportunities, opportunities for students to grow, to meet our workforce needs. Nursing and academic officials praised the agreement for, among other things, involving Murray Regional Medical Center in helping nursing students acquire their BSN degrees. The agreement outlines course requirements needed to transfer from Columbia State College to MTSU. Well, MTSU Center for Innovation and Media has another achievement to add to its credits. The center combined electronic media communication, EMC production, the student newspaper sidelines, and student programming to provide three hours of live election coverage to viewers of MT10 HD and WMOT, as well as WMTS FM. Gearing up for the ambitious endeavor was five months in the planning. I think we took this, the idea of doing an election show, a college election show, uh, to totally new ground here. Uh, I don't think anything to this scale has ever been attempted here at MTSU. And um, I think it's a, a fairly safe bet that uh, anywhere around the country, this was a, a, a very big project, a very aggressive project. And we pulled it off. It looked great up there on the air. We heard a number of people who were over there, faculty and, and students alike, uh, complimenting the production, the production values, the information that was being uh, put out over the air. The students' three hours of live reporting also was fed onto a large screen in the new Student Union Ballroom, where election night partygoers also could watch CNN and Fox coverage. An update now on MTSU's new $147 million science building. In mid-October, the first beams for the more than 250,000 square foot building were erected. But look at it now. New York-based Turner Construction continues to make progress toward an expected spring 2015 completion date. This is a rendering of what the new science building will look like when it is added next to Walker Library. MTSU's Honors College magazine has garnered a top national award. It shares the co-first place award with the University of Houston. The National Collegiate Honors Council designated MTSU's Honors College magazine for the award after editors added more color and design features. Dr. John Vile, the Dean of the Honors College, noted that the magazine has finished second place in the past, but this is the first time the university has shared the top spot. MTSU has a new iPad-only mini version of MTSU Magazine. It provides even more stories and videos for you to access on accomplishments occurring here on campus. Readers of MTSU Magazine can download free electronic versions with added content to their iPads or iPhones. You can find the new MTSU Magazine app on iTunes or on the mtsunews.com website by clicking the tab for the MTSU Magazine. Well, more than 60 MTSU's top scholars now are full-fledged members of Phi Kappa Phi. 
the oldest and most selective academic honor society in the nation. The new inductees were initiated during a ceremony in November. To be eligible, juniors must rank in the top 7.5 percent of their class, seniors and graduate students in the top 10 percent. Phi Kappa Phi was created in 1897. MTSU last month celebrated a year of vet success on campus. MTSU's Vet Success Office was the first in Tennessee and is one of only approximately 23 nationwide. An open house to celebrate the new office space in Keithley University Center included remarks by MTSU President Sidney McPhee and a visit by the Director of Vocational Rehabilitation Services for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Ruth Fanning. Heather Conrad says between late March and the end of September, some 568 veterans received career vocational assistance on campus. More than 1,000 veterans are enrolled in classes this fall. Well, for 31 years, MTSU has honored veterans with a Salute to Armed Services Veterans Day event. Each year, the salute includes the naming of the Joe Nunley Award winner. Graduate student Susan Nogis provides a taste of this year's Veterans Day event. Trained out of Fort Hood, Texas, and you know, a lot of people don't know anything about the tank destroyers, but at one time we occupied Fort Hood, Texas, and we had on parade one day, and we had 60,000 tank destroyers on parade that day. And when I say that day, I mean all day. It took us all day to go by the reviewing stand. <laughs> and, uh, but we had actually in the tank destroyers 100,000 people in the tank destroyers. We was the advanced element uh, and we was the first heavy gun to go ashore in, in Normandy. We went in on the Omaha Beach. Thank you very, very much for this unique uh, privilege, awesome honor to be selected for such a beautiful humbling award and this Armed Service Veterans Day. This gun, it traveled 5,280 feet per second, a little over a mile a second. So you can imagine the blast that we got, like a keen clap of lightning every time we fired it. And uh, that's one reason that I have a 75% loss on hearing today. <laughs> right after Pearl Harbor, we huddled together and said, what are we gonna do about our great country? to fight this new enemy we have across the ocean. And we decided that then and there that we needed to do something for our good old USA. Well, thank you a lot, and I appreciate being here today. I'm admitting my age, because next February, I'll be reaching 90 years old, and I'm still hopeful that I have another 10 years to to be able to serve others and serve other veterans as I continue to work in an awesome fashion that I'm blessed with, I say. Thank you very much for the honor. Thank you very, very much. The day's festivities also included the traditional salute to U.S. Armed Services at halftime, featuring the Band of Blue and a Toys for Tots collection by the Marine Corps. That's why the Battle of Stone River goes into the books as one of the most important Union victories of the war, because it is the victory that supports this document. Being True Blue is helping students solve real world problems. My name is Cliff Ricketts and I am True Blue. I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. Being True Blue is embracing unique perspectives. My name is Iris Montes, and I am True Blue.
Being true blue is making the world a safer place. My name is Sam Willie, and I am true blue. One hundred and fifty years ago this month, December 31st through January 2nd to be exact, soldiers from the North and South fought a critical and bloody battle in Murfreesboro known as Stones River. The National Park Service is commemorating the sesquicentennial of the Battle of Stones River with educational and interpretive programs, including infantry and artillery demonstrations throughout the last week of December, the 26th through January 2nd. MTSU has also played a critical role in helping the volunteer state commemorate the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. MTSU history professor Dr. Carol Van West is the co-chair of the Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission. The Stones River became what President Lincoln called a hard-earned victory. It was crucial for Lincoln because it came at the very same time the president issued the famous Emancipation Proclamation, January 1, 1863 an executive order freeing slaves in Confederate territory. Perhaps most important at the time, the war had been cast in terms of freedom against slavery. You know, the Confederates had a chance to turn things around here. Once they lost it on this battlefield, though, it's going to pretty much be one brutal retreat after another until essentially the entire Western Confederacy is gobbled up. Jim Lewis interprets history for the National Park Service at Stones River National Battlefield. Sharing the story of the Civil War battle to visitors, like these teachers, learning how to use primary sources in the classroom. With the battle's sesquicentennial days away, interest in the bloody three-day confrontation fought 150 years ago on this field has risen, along with another historic event, the Emancipation Proclamation. So here it is. It starts off that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, that people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, forever free. In this painting by Francis Bicknell Carpenter, President Lincoln is seen with his cabinet on the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. It's an executive order based upon legal and military strategy. Lincoln, um, at bottom, was a constitutionalist. I think you, you can't really understand Lincoln without understanding how dedicated he was to the Constitution. And that's why a, 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 you have to read the, the Emancipation Proclamation very clearly. It's not written in Lincoln's terms at all. It's not the, the Gettysburg Address. It's not his second inaugural. Um, it's very legally written. He keeps it within the bounds of the Constitution. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons. While the Emancipation Proclamation was celebrated by slaves, it didn't immediately free them all. In fact, it didn't make slavery illegal and only applied to the 10 states in rebellion. Kentucky, which had not seceded from the Union, did not free slaves until 1865. Tennessee was not included because it was mostly under Union control as the federal army surged south from Nashville to Murfreesboro. And as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, due on this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863. The Emancipation Proclamation came 100 days from the issuance of Lincoln's preliminary proclamation issued on September 22, 1862 essentially announcing his intention to free slaves and giving rebellious states time to act on their own. And of course, keep in mind that this thing did come out in September. So they've had this in front of them in all those places listed. Are and henceforward shall be free. Lincoln is essentially saying, if you're still in rebellion, your slaves are free. The Army and Navy are going to make it so. As the Union Army moved south, many slaves freed themselves and escaped to the protection of the men in blue. The Confederates considered slaves property. The Federals took them in as contraband. Well, fine, you're using slaves to grow crops, build your earthworks, work in your factories. So when we get them, we're keeping them as contraband of war. That was how some Union officers tried to do an end around around the Fugitive Slave Act. Many slaves joined the Army and became members of the United States Colored Troops. They're also devastating to the Southern cause because 
What is a white Southern civilian's worst nightmare? An armed arm. black man. Now imagine 1,100 armed black men formed on the outskirts of Murfreesboro in the 13th United States Colored Infantry. What person in their right mind can believe that those folks will put their guns down and go back to being slaves? The Emancipation Proclamation not only formally freed slaves in the rebellious states, it became a recruiting tool for slaves to join the Union Army. Because now it is the Army's job to protect these people after January 1st, should they become free, make their way to the Union Army, it has set us down the road to basically as the Union Army continues its movement southward, it will con essentially continue to do what it has already been doing. And in a way, it's a recognition of what's already been happening. And that is, when the Army's there, the slave the enslaved people come to it. Yeah. Everywhere the Union Army goes, slavery will be destroyed. The institution will be essentially destroyed once the Union Army achieves victory on the ground and at sea. Emancipation created the opportunity to free all the slaves, but technically, in early 1863, it hadn't happened. Emancipation, as ordered by Lincoln, was still dependent on the military success. That's why the Battle of Stones River goes into the books as one of the most important Union victories of the war, because it is the victory that supports this document and starts us down this road that will eventually destroy that institution. But destroying the institution came with a horrendous loss of life. In a recent reconsideration of the Civil War, it still matters. Former NPS chief historian Dwight Pitt Cathley visualized the 620,000 deaths by comparing it to the Vietnam Memorial. If we were to create a similar memorial with 620,000 names lost during the Civil War, a more accurate way of looking or comparing it to the deaths in Vietnam would be to look at 2% of the 1960 population. And if we run those numbers, the number of deaths is not 620,000, or a million, or two million, or three million, but four million names. If we built a wall like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington to accommodate four million names, and we built it along the lines of the current memorial, it would run from the Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol building almost two miles distance and back to the Lincoln Memorial and back to the Capitol building and a little beyond almost to the Anacostia River. Even today, some are prone to argue that the Civil War was not fought over slavery. But Pitt Cathley argues the evidence supports slavery as the major cause. In the run-up to the war, he finds 66 proposals to amend the U.S. Constitution. Of the 66, Fully 90% were designed specifically to strengthen the institution of slavery in varying ways throughout the country. In essence, the former NPS chief historian reminds us, 150 years after the nation's bloodiest war, southern states sought to expand federal authority to protect the institution of slavery. The secession crisis was at its core a constitutional crisis, and any attempt to understand secession should be grounded in the dozens of proposed constitutional amendments aimed at strengthening the institution, not through the expansion of state authority, but through an expansion of federal authority. The Civil War still matters, Pitt Cathley says, because as historian Drew Gilpin Faust reminds us in This Republic of Suffering, the war helped define meanings of freedom, citizenship, and equality to embody what Lincoln called a new birth of freedom. During the war, some 200,000 blacks, mostly ex-slaves, joined the federal forces by the end of the war, the United States colored troops made up 10% of the entire Union Army. After it was fully adopted at the end of 1865, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. For a full schedule of the week-long events commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Stones River, visit www.nts.gov. <laughs>
For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. All in. I call. I don't know how you guys do it at your place, but MT is tobacco free. The Blue Raider football team headed into December with a strong 8-3 record and still in the hunt for the conference championship following wins over Western Kentucky, South Alabama and Sunbelt nemesis Troy 24-21 at Floyd Stadium. The Troy Trojans were leading 21-16 and marching downfield with less than six minutes in the game when Kevin Byer intercepted a pass and returned it 77 yards for a touchdown to give the Blue Raiders the lead and the victory. It was one of an amazing five turnovers for MTSU on the day. But, you know, just a tremendous play. Kevin's a, a, a great athlete. I think he showed his athleticism, you know, on the sideline there where, you know, to stay in bounds and, and just uh, a tremendous play. And, uh, you know, we needed a play because we were struggling offensively. We were struggling on offense. And it was a great interception. It really was. It was a tremendous interception. Uh, I was surprised he came out of there with it. The five turnovers included this fumble recovery by Diarco Nolan, who returned the ball 59 yards all the way to the eight-yard line. Freshman running back Jordan Parker entered the record books with a 98-yard TD run, the longest in both Middle Tennessee and Sun Belt history. Every, they hear it all the time, never beat Troy, can't beat Troy, all that. I wanted them to win so they didn't have to answer that question, why can't you beat Troy? So Troy is a rival, it's Troy, and, and, and you know, we haven't had much luck against them you know, the last six years, and, and to finally win and see these guys experience that success and you know, the thrill of victory, and there, there's nothing greater you know, to, to be in a locker room after a win and just see the emotion and the happiness uh, of winning a game. Earlier against South Alabama, the Blue Raider defense forced four turnovers, including this interception by Jawan Harley, and held South Alabama to just 12 points. On the offensive side of the ball, quarterback Logan Kilgore connected on two touchdown passes, including this 49-yarder to Smyrna native Jeremiah Bryson, who finished with five catches and 80 yards on the day. MTSU beat South Alabama. 20 to 12. The month of November kicked off with a 34 to 29 road victory over Western Kentucky. That game was highlighted by a 96 yard touchdown kickoff return by Reggie Watley. True freshman Jordan Parker ran for 149 yards, including a 58 yard touchdown run. 
The game was enough to garner the freshman Tennessee Sports Writers Offensive Player of the Week. Senior wide receiver Anthony Amos continued to impress with two touchdown receptions in the game against Western Kentucky. Amos was also named a finalist for the Geico Play of the Year after this spectacular one-handed grab in the end zone against Georgia Tech. His catch was among the eight best in college football plays shown on CBS November 23rd. Well, high hopes for MTSU basketball fans this winter. The Blue Raiders men's team is coming off a record-setting 27 wins last season and returned 10 of the top 12 scorers from a year ago. MTSU opened the 2012-13 season with a 97-53 victory over Alabama State as Jason Jones scored 19 points. James Gallman also scored in double figures with 15 points, including this three-pointer. In a close 58-55 win at Savannah State, MTSU's Marcos Knight knocked down 21 points to lead the Blue Raiders. Nine other teammates put points on the board. After falling to number 10 ranked Florida, the Blue Raiders recovered with a 75-61 victory over Central Florida in which Sean Jones scored 18 points and grabbed 13 rebounds. Then MTSU dominated Texas Southern 79-52 as Sean Jones scored a career-high 21 points to help the Blue Raiders improve their record to 4-1 heading into December. The Lady Raiders kicked off the basketball season with wins over Kennesaw State and Memphis in the preseason women's NIT before falling to Iowa in overtime 69-63. Heading into December, the Lady Raiders were 4-1 after starting the Sun Belt with a 72-45 win over Louisiana. Junior Ebony Rowe was named Player of the Week from both the Sun Belt Conference, her eighth all-time, and the Tennessee Sports Writers Association after averaging 21 points and nine rebounds in the Blue Raiders' opening two wins. She was also honored at home for becoming a member of the 1,000-point club in her career. For more information on MTSU News, be sure to go to mtsunews.com. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Have a happy holiday season. Until next time, stay true blue.